How's everybody doing tonight? Great. Good. It's great to see another packed room. Welcome back to Maple Ridge. Um, I'm Crystal Collette, and I'm co-facilitator of Invisible Loudville with Lee Bass. Hey guys, thank you for coming out again tonight. My wife uh, has made homemade chocolate chip cookies. So they are, uh, they're right in the back there. Actually, while, while Crystal introduces, I'll bring them out and pass them around. That's it's a good way to start. Good, idea. <laughs> good way to start. So I think we're gonna keep the lights um, low so that we can all see the project projector screen. Can everyone see okay-ish? Yeah. Yeah. Good. Hopefully none of us, I don't think we'll fall asleep. I don't I think there's risk of that. So. Um, how many folks, just by show of hands, were here for our first forum? Great. Oh, so maybe like half. What? For our first forum, forum about yeah. six weeks ago. Yeah. 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 Okay. Okay. Um, well, welcome to those of you who are just joining us tonight. Um, our plan for tonight is a little bit different. Last time we had a open dialogue um, with folks sharing their thoughts and. Um, perspectives and different experiences um, around gun ownership um, and perspectives on gun control versus rights to firearms. Um, it was really like an open dialogue. Tonight um, we're going to do more of like a TED Talk style um, presentation, meaning that we have four presenters here with us tonight who are all going to talk for about 20 minutes um, about a specific issue. Um, we worked hard to get folks uh, along different and representing different aspects of the issue and different political and social perspectives. Um, and let's see. Um, I think our Indivisible Laval's vision for tonight was to create um, a space where we can learn together and listen. So last time was about talking. Tonight is more about listening. And I know for myself, sometimes listening to someone present um, facts that, I've, that are new to me or an opinion that's new to me, that can be uncomfortable, right? It can be uncomfortable to just sit and listen to a different perspective. But at Indivisible Loudville, we believe that that's part of what we've lost in our culture lately, that we need to learn how to sit and listen to each other. Um, so. Um, in putting together tonight, our group um, just wanted to share that our overall goal is to work to make our community safer and to provide information that will allow our local community and our national dialogue to make strides towards that goal of safer community. So I think it's a rare person that can't get behind that goal. And the thing is, we just all see different ways of getting there. So that's the intent for tonight. Um, just in case anyone's not familiar with Indivisible Lauville, um, we're a community of folks with lots of different ideas and values, political leanings and ways of life. And um, but the agreement that we all have, the reason we come together as a group is that we feel that our current administration in Washington um, isn't representing our values of um, justice and equity. So that's our purpose, and as the organizer of this event, we wanted to be upfront about that. Um, and we were formed, Indivisible is a national organization that was formed after Trump was elected, um, and our call to action is to stand up to what we see as discriminatory policies and predatory actions um, against our values. Uh, we have various committees that are working on different issues like um, health care, women's rights, the environment, um, and uh, we particularly envision ourselves standing up for folks who are most vulnerable. Okay? So, our, just to review one more time, our structures, I'm going to introduce each presenter, they're going to share their thoughts with us for 20 minutes. Each presenter has that 20 minutes to present and possibly take a few questions, but that's their call whether they're going to take questions or not. Um, and if they do take questions, we're going to have to keep it real quick. So, all right. Any questions about structure for this evening? All right. Well, let's get started then. Um, we're going to start um, with Adam Madison, and he's going to talk with us about regulating gun laws. 
So Adam grew up in Philadelphia, New York, right here, graduating from Indian River. And he graduated cum laude from Regent University Law School in Virginia Beach. Nice and warm down there, good choice for law school. In 99 and was admitted to the New York Bar in 2000. His first job was working with tax-exempt organizations, usually churches and other religious organizations in Buffalo, before he moved here to New York in 2007 and started his own law practice. Adam's on the board of um, Beaver Camp and Double Play, and his wife Rebecca is a nurse at Lewis County General, and they have four children. Um, one's a student at JCC and the other three are from school. So, thanks, Adam. Thanks, Glad. Yep. Always a good idea to start with a lawyer because then I'm not tasked with keeping you awake if the meeting drags on long. <laughs> um, my name's Adam Madison. I'm a lawyer right here in Lavo, as, as was said. And I was asked to talk about gun laws specifically in New York. So the information that I'm going to present tonight is specifically related to New York laws. And I, I did not research, I'm not prepared to discuss anything federally. We're just going to discuss what happens here in the state of New York. Um, just to keep that in mind. So one of the first things I want to talk about, one of the things that they, they drill into you when you're in law school, bad facts make bad law. And the lawyers are great with telling stories. That's what a case law is. Um, a quick story, uh, one of my first trials in Syracuse in a family court matter involved a man who was, um, needless to say, very quirky. Uh, at the end of the trial, the court made an order that says that this man would not be able to discuss religion or religious beliefs with his own children based on some of his beliefs, which of course violates his First Amendment rights. I think everybody would agree with that. The National Church of which he was a part of contacted my office and wanted to appeal. Um, the attorney that I was working with at the time says, maybe before we do that, you should go talk to this man. And when they did, they found out that he believed that men were the head of the household and that if he paid any child support, he was making her the head of the household and that was a violation of the Bible. And anytime he thought that they were doing something that they weren't supposed to be doing on the Sabbath, which was in his mind Saturday, he would race out to New York and take the kids and that sort of thing. This man was a nut, all right? And after talking to them, the national organization came to me and says, you know what, we're afraid that bad facts will make bad law, and that an appellate court will look at this case and says, in this particular instance, the, the lower court was right, <coughs> all right? That, and, and then there would be precedent now for denying parents the ability to talk to their kids about their own religion. So they said, no, we're not taking that, and of course, he didn't pursue it because he didn't have the money to pay outrageous fees for appeals. Well, how does that relate to the discussion that we have at hand? And and the simple thing is, when when law becomes reactive, when law becomes, it, it's not thought out, it's not rational, we end up with bad law. So whenever you have something like the SAFE Act, which has many good things in it, it also has some bad things in it. But the SAFE Act was passed overnight in reaction to what happened in um, Sandy Hook. So we end up with things like this. An assault weapon means a semi-automatic rifle that has the ability to accept a detachable magazine, at least one of the following characteristics. You work on several down. A flash suppressor, a muzzle brake, muzzle compensator, a uh, threaded barrel design to accommodate a flash suppressor or a muzzle brake. Anybody here, can anybody here see what's wrong with that statement? We got a couple. What's wrong with the statement? Speaking as an expert on the, on the topic, as the author of the National Armors Manual for the Department of Defense, the definition of assault weapon requires that the weapon be fully automatic, not semi-automatic. Okay, well this is New York's definition. I understand that. But there's but something very, very wrong, and I'll, I'll flash over to this. Um, there's no such thing as a muzzle brake. <laughs> there is a muzzle brake, but not a muzzle brake, okay? <laughs> brake as in put your foot on the brake, oh. exists. Brake as in brake bread, or brake you know, your arm, which is the, the, the word that's used in the statute, doesn't exist. Or we could go on from there. Um, this is an old statute, criminal possession of a weapon of the fourth degree. A person is guilty when he or she possesses any firearm uh, or any number of other weapons, including a Kung Fu star. Is anybody familiar with Kung Fu stars? <laughs> they actually exist. 
This is a class A misdemeanor according to Penal Law 265.01. Well, the SAFE Act added this, criminal possession of a firearm. A person is guilty of criminal possession of a firearm when he possesses a firearm. <laughs> They're exactly the same, only a criminal possession of a weapon in the fourth degree is a class A misdemeanor. Criminal possession of a firearm is a class E felony. So what are you violating if you unlawfully possess a firearm? Are you committing a class A misdemeanor or a class E felony? All right. I spoke to our district attorney about this because I spent about 45 minutes trying to figure out what the difference was. She says, you know what, honestly, I have never prosecuted in the five years the SAFE Act has been in existence, she has never prosecuted anyone under this act. You know why? Because generally when somebody is criminally possessing a firearm, there's something else going on. Whether it's being used in a drug raid, whether it's being used in a domestic violence incident, something else. This law is basically meaningless, according to our district attorney. All right? But not only is it not applicable, but when you have two separate statutes like this that both prescribe the same conduct and and in doing so give you a class A and a class E felony, it sets up a constitutional argument because in order for something, somebody to be guilty of something, you have to know ahead of time what you're guilty of. The statute has to be there. If I go out and I dig a hole in somebody's yard and there's no law prohibiting me from doing that, you can't come back later and say you've, you know, you've committed certain acts, you've, you've committed trespass or whatever. Because there's a law there describing that, then you can charge me with something. All right. In this case, because the same law, the same act gives two different penalties, it sets up a very um, a, a good constitutional argument to say that neither one of them are valid. But it goes beyond that. Let's see number three. It shall be unlawful. This is penal law, section 265.36. It shall be unlawful for a person to knowingly possess a large capacity ammunition feeding device manufactured before September 13th, 1994. And if such person lawfully possess such a large capacity feeding device before the effective date of this chapter of the laws of 2013, which added the section that has a capacity of or can be readily restored or converted to accept more than 10 rounds of ammunition, period. <laughs> That's the statute. This is Penal Law 265.36. It's still on the books. You can look it up. All right. But basically, from the if then, period. It says nothing. It means nothing. There's nothing there. Okay. So these are our legislators who created these statutes, you know, and, and maybe we can look at the break and say, well, that's just a, a, a typographical error. That's just a, you know, an issue. Maybe we can look at this and say, well, you know what, that's just a grammatical error. Uh, you know, the problem is as a lawyer, words mean things. All right. I once won an appeal because the statute that was referring to the case that I was using used the word or instead of and. All right. If you're using the word break instead of break, you're setting up problems. So removing ourselves from the problems in creating laws just like this, let's take a look at what the laws are. Okay. In the state of New York, we're going to break it down into four different types of guns. Muzzle loaders, rifles and shotguns, handguns, and uh, assault weapons. All right. Muzzle loaders not considered a firearm in the state of New York for the purpose of any statute, okay? Um, no license, background check necessary to purchase uh, a muzzleloader. You can go into Walmart, pick up a muzzleloader, walk out with it that day, all right? You can buy one at a gun show, you can buy one from a friend, or an individual, a brother, whoever, all right? The muzzleloaders, you're all familiar with those, they're like the old muskets, you gotta jam the powder in, and jam the bullet in, and run it down with a ramrod, and mm -hmm. use them. So, those are your muzzle loaders. <clears throat> Rifles and shotguns, on the other hand, may or may not be considered a firearm depending on the section of the law. All right. Under the criminal law, criminal procedure law, a rifle with a barrel longer than 16 inches, which is most of your hunting rifles, those sort of things, not considered a firearm. All right. However, under the general business law, it is considered a firearm. All right. So you got to look at what. Uh, um, what section of the law you're asking as to whether it is or is not a firearm. All right, you do not require a, less, uh, a license, I'm sorry, to possess uh, a rifle. Um, it does not need to be registered, so you don't have to have any type of registration requirements. Uh, all purchases of rifles or shotguns in the state of New York require a background check. 
All right, that's every purchase, not just from a store, from a gun show, but if you're buying a rifle from uh, a friend, a neighbor, a relative, something along those lines, require um, a background check with the exception of immediate family member. An immediate family member, according to the statute, is defined as parent, child, uh, spouse, or paramour, I believe, are the, the things. So, um, yeah, uh, so um, I only own, uh, I own myself, I own three um, rifles. I own a muzzle loader, I own a 30-30 and a 30 out I don't own the 30 out six. Um, my brother-in-law owns it. I borrowed a 30 out six. Um, he's gonna sell that to me. Before I buy that from him, I have to go get a background check. Um, my father gave me the 30-30 because of my grandfather's. Uh, so because we're immediate family members, I didn't need any type of background check for that. Um, to get a background check for a private sale, you can do that. Uh, I went and talked to a person at Walmart. Um, they'll do them there for free. Um, other, other places uh, are allowed to charge $10 for, um, uh, for the background check. Uh, when I talked to the guy at Walmart, it's supposed to be a national instant background check service. Instant means two to three days, apparently. So um, in legal terms, that's like, you know, like that. Uh, uh, handguns, this is the uh, James Bond, Walter PPK. Um, you must be licensed to own a handgun. Um, each gun you own must be registered on your license. You cannot have a gun that's not on your license. And it's illegal in New York State to even possess uh, a handgun unless it is on your license. All right. In the definition of firearms under the criminal law, Pistols and handguns are considered firearms, and it is illegal to, to, to have one. The only the exceptions are if, um, if they're licensed. Uh, all sales of handguns require background checks. Okay. And then the, uh, the dreaded assault rifle, the, the uh, ever popular AR-15 there. Um, sales and transfers of assault rifles in the state of New York are banned. You may not purchase an assault rifle in the state of New York uh, after the SAFE Act went into place in 2013. Those who owned assault rifles before 2013 must either modify the rifle so there's no longer an assault rifle or um, register it and renew the registration every five years. Um, or you can sell it to somebody out of state. Okay. Uh, which I found rather interesting. Um, assault rifles are too dangerous for New Yorkers to own, but if you want to sell them to somebody in Pennsylvania, that's fine. Maybe they, uh, uh, rifles may not be transferred privately in state except uh, to law enforcement, even on death. So if you have an assault rifle, it's been registered, and you keep it and you die, that assault rifle must be transferred back to the police. Uh, to a law enforcement officer. You are not allowed to leave it to your children or anybody else. So what is an assault rifle? And I'll go over some of these, I'll go over these rather quickly. In the state of New York, this is the state of New York's definition. Again, it may be different federally, it may be different somewhere else. The state of New York, a semi-automatic rifle that has an ability to accept a detachable magazine and at least one of the following. Telescoping stock, pistol grip, thumb stock, uh, second hand grip or protruding grip that can be used by the non-trigger hand, um, a bayonet mount, uh, again there's the flash suppressor, muzzle brake that we talked about before, or a grenade launcher. So if you have a, a rifle that can accept a grenade launcher, uh, if it was also a semi-automatic, it's considered an assault rifle. Then there's the semi-automatic shotguns, um, which have at least one of the following, folding or telescoping stock, thumb hole stock, second hand grip, magazine capacity in excess of seven rounds, Ability to accept the capital magazines. All right, those are that's a that's a uh, assault shotgun, shot uh, assault weapons uh, shotgun. And then there's a pistol. Um, pistols and handguns are also can also be considered uh, assault weapons if they have the following characteristics: folding or telescoping stocks, thumb hole stocks, second hand grips, capacity to accept ammunition magazine that attaches to the pistol outside the pistol grip. Threaded barrel clip, uh, I'm sorry, threaded barrel capable of accepting um, barrel extenders, flash suppressors, so on and so forth. Uh, a shroud that is attached to the barrel that would prevent the shooter from burning his hand. Um, manufactured weight of 50 ounces, 
or this last one, which is kind of blurry, a semi-automatic version of an automatic rifle, shotgun, or firearm, whatever that is. All right, we'll come to that. We'll come back to that in a minute. We'll forget that. All right. So the New York State Safe Act. It was passed in 2013, but again, it amends the following. All right, and I'm just going to go through all of these just for the sake of time. All of these sections of the law, all of these sections of the law, were amended overnight by the New York State Legislature in response to Sandy Hook. Criminal Procedure Law, which we've talked about, Corrections Law, the Family Court Act, uh, which will come up in just a minute, Executive Law, the General Business Law, which talks about the sale of firearms, Judiciary Law, Mental Hygiene, um, Penal Law, and the Surrogate Court Procedure Act. Surrogate Court is what you do with dead people's things. Um, people at Surrogate Court are notoriously grumpy because they deal with dead people's things all day. But I find that if you wear a silly tie when you go talk to them, they're a lot happier. All right. Recent amendments. These are some amendments that came up with the SAFE Act uh, just recently. Um, it suspends the requirements that only seven rounds, uh, only magazines containing seven rounds can be purchased. Now, ten rounds can be purchased, but you can still only put seven rounds in the ten round magazine. All right. Um, the reason this was amended was when they found out that nobody sells seven round magazines, okay? So they said, we're gonna modify it, but we're only gonna allow you to put seven rounds in it, okay? That modification has been held unconstitutional by the Second Circuit District Court, um, but it's still enforced uh, in a lot of areas who wanna say, you know what, if you don't like being charged with violating this, then take it to you know, the higher levels, okay? It also, here's another problem with the SAFE Act that I didn't talk about earlier. Uh, they had to amend the law to clarify that law enforcement are exempt from prohibitions on high capacity magazines containing seven rounds, as well as the law prohibiting weapons on school grounds. All right, The SAFE Act made it illegal to possess a weapon on school grounds, any weapon on school grounds, but forgot to say, oh, except law enforcement. So if we had an active shooter up at Lowellville, Sheriff Carpinelli had to drop his weapon at the door before he not going on a school property or else he'd be in violation of the SAFE Act. It's recently been amended, but again, what we're, see we're seeing again, the fact that the law is being passed reactively, okay? That's why these things are so great. It's such a good thing for everybody to be here because when we sit and when we talk and we think about things, then we can pass common sense laws that everybody can agree on, all right? When we pass it reactively, Sheriff Carpinelli can't enter the school grounds with his rifle uh, or his pistol or his firearm, whatever it is, whatever he uses, in order to prevent any type of crimes going on there. And then the last one is ensuring uh, local safe storage laws are not presented by the safe, not preempted by the safe act. So if the locality or municipality has uh, safe storage laws which require firearms to be held in lock under lockers or certain types of things. Um, they didn't want the SAFE Act to preempt those. So if the, if the village of Laval said you, in your car, you have to have your, your rifle locked when you're going to, to back and forth between your home and the hunting grounds, it's nothing to wear of, it doesn't. But if some municipalities had that, they didn't want the SAFE Act to preempt those. Okay. The, uh, there's only a few case laws that have been, law moves slow, typically, all right? The wheels of justice turn slowly, is a common saying in, the, in, in your in our um, law school classes. So here's the only case law that I'm aware of on the safe act. It's New York Rifle and Pistol Association versus Cuomo. Western District of New York, which is in Buffalo, have, uh, heard the case in 2013, and then it was appealed to the second district court, which is a district court over New York, Connecticut, uh, the area. These are federal courts, they're not state courts, and they heard the case in 2015. All right. The Second Circuit and the Western District Circuit both found the SAFE Act to be uh, constitutional. Um, they did strike down the ban on loading more than seven rounds in, uh, in a magazine. Um, they declared un um, unconstitutionally vague the if and clause that we talked about before um, and the provision regarding the muzzle brake. Um, and the provision regarding whether the pistol is a version of an assault rifle. They said nobody really knows if their pistol is a version of an assault rifle. Um, so we're going to strike all of those things. The rest of the SAFE Act they left in place. Um, and as I mentioned, when the case came out in the Western District in 2013, 
There was an interview with Bill Fitzpatrick who said that he was going to enforce the seven bullet limit anyway. So um, again, that's that's the um, that's down in Syracuse. Um, I didn't ask Miss Mosier what she would do uh, in this event, but I wouldn't. You know, it's it's one of those things. District attorneys have discretion. So um, if you happen to accidentally <coughs> put more than seven bullets in your hunting rifle and you get stopped by the game warden, my guess is nothing's going to happen. Uh, if you are, um, you know, in a meth house and you have a high capacity magazine with, you know, 10 bullets in it, I'm guessing you're going to get charged. <laughs> so. um, and then lastly, removal of your rights or to own or possess a firearm. Um, any order of protection, whether it's temporary or permanent, um, makes a federal crime for anyone to buy, possess, or transfer a handgun, rifle, shotgun, or other firearm or ammunition while the order is in effect. Right? A lot of times, um, you see, I see these all the time. Somebody uh, has a girlfriend, makes a, the guy makes the girlfriend mad. She goes to family court, files for order of protection. Uh, the judge issues a temporary order of protection. The sheriff comes and not only serves it, but says, "Hey, do you have any weapons in here? I need to take them." Okay. It happens a lot. Um, sometimes, pardon? All right, this is the last, the last point. So, um, so it is uh, a federal crime to possess a firearm. All right. Um, and lastly, and this is this is new, just as of a couple of weeks ago, I think uh, Governor Cuomo signed a new, a new statute expanding the um, the provisions under state law that those who are convicted of uh, certain felonies. And now offenses that are considered domestic violence misdemeanors may not possess a firearm or rifle. These are things like um, aggravated harassment, um, criminal obstruction of breathing or blood circulation, things of that nature. These are, and these domestic violence um, misdemeanors have to be committed against someone of the same family. So uh, if I go uh, you know, hit Lee Vance on the way out of here because he said something to make me angry, um, that is not a domestic violence. It's a violent crime, but it's not a domestic violence crime that would subject me to these provisions. Uh, although the court may issue an order of protection, preventing me from going next to Mr. Vance at a later point, uh, which would subject me to the upper restriction. Um, but as far as the domestic violence, it's not. If uh, my wife and I got into an argument and the same thing happened, and I was convicted, then even if the court issues an order of protection and it expires, because of this new provision here, um, and it's considered domestic violence misdemeanor, I may, my, my rights to own or possess a firearm will be removed permanently. So, um, that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, I'll let you get that queued up while I'm introducing you. <laughs> All right, so next um, we have Ben Birchoff. Ben's going to talk with us about gun violence statistics. Um, Ben's a Lewis County native. He double majored in psychology and criminal justice at SUNY Brockport. He's a New York State licensed concealed carry holder and an avid defender of the Second Amendment. He advocates for moderate gun laws based on federal data and national trends. So take away, Ben. Thank you. How's it going tonight, everyone? Yeah. Hey. Hey. Wonderful. Um, as I was introduced, my name is Ben Birchinoff. I'm also a graduate of Beaver River, so you can probably just disregard everything I'm going to say. It's all wrong. So, uh, a lot of this, I'm trying to, my goal tonight at least, is to kind of get us a baseline to talk about uh, just gun violence, uh, homicides, suicides, everything involved with gun deaths in the United States. Um, a lot of the problems that you have when you're discussing gun violence with people is that everyone has different sources, and everyone says, this source says this, this source says that. So my goal was to use as many federal sources as I could, just as a baseline. I know that not a lot of us trust the government to track things accurately, but that's what I'm using, and that's kind of just the baseline we're going to build off and to have a conversation. So to start with, um, total gun deaths, this is for 2013, and this is pretty stable. Um, throughout history, at least since the mid-90s, gun violence has been going down in the United States. But for 2013, there was 33,000 gun deaths. Um, the large majority of them are suicides, and that's always been the case in the United States. Suicides take up the majority of gun deaths in the United States. Um, homicide follows that with 11,208, and negligent or accidental discharges account for 505, and then undetermined intent is 281. 
like I said, firearm homicide has been going down consistently in uh, since the mid '90s. It peaked around 1991. During that time, there was a lot of uh, perfect. Um, there was a lot of violent crime, mostly because of the drugs of the '90s. There's the crack epidemic, and then there's a lot of racial tensions with uh, things like Rodney King and things of that nature. Um, but as you can see, we've consistently been going down in firearms, uh, firearm homicide rates at least. And that's been true of almost all the way back to like the 1970s. Homicide by firearm type. This is where it gets kind of interesting because a lot of the discussion, at least in the modern area, is talking about rifles, assault rifles, semi-automatic rifles. And the majority of gun crime is committed with handguns. And that's, that, like I said, that's been consistent for uh, the last, I would say, 20 years. Um, handguns are overwhelmingly more often used than anything else. Rifles and shotguns are next. Uh, shotguns actually cause more deaths and at least this data from, I want to say this was from 2013 that I pulled too, was that shotguns had more crimes committed with them than rifles did. Mm -hmm. uh, an uh, one problem is that we have a lot of unconfirmed gun deaths and that's because some rifles have the same calibers as pistols and it's kind of hard to determine what weapon was used just based off, off of like a body or a corpse that was found. So these are the demographic factors for gun violence. Um, overwhelmingly, the offenders of gun violence are African Americans at 56.9%. Age, it's usually younger. Um, I didn't have a lot of data be before age 18, just based on arrest records and juvenile courts and things like that made it kind of complicated. But it's usually young African American males and in large cities. I don't think the large city part really surprises anyone. Um, but one thing I want everyone to take away from this is that the majority of gun violence is black on black crime and white on white crime. There's not a lot of mixing of the races when it comes to gun crime. Um, and often the gun violence in the United States at least is it's between people that know each other. So your neighbor, your spouse, and domestic violence is really common. And another thing is that almost all gun crime is linked to high population centers where population density is really high. Um, just more people in a smaller area usually correlates pretty closely to more gun crime. So this slide's kind of confusing for some people and other people probably know where I'm going with this. Um, a lot of times we're compared as a country to other countries just based on how much more violent crime we have, how much more gun crime we have as a country. And people always compare it to Australia due to a couple different factors that I'll go into. Um, at least in this slide, and this was actually published by the Australian Bureau of Statistics, it shows the rate of gun homicide in the USA has actually declined more than Australia has. Australia had a lot lower level to begin with, so they had a lot less to drop, but we've gone down 57% since 1979. In that time, Australia has dropped 21%. So the reason a lot of people compare us to Australia is because before about 1996, we had really similar gun laws. We had a very similar gun culture. But what happened in 1996 in Australia was the Port Arthur Massacre, where a man killed 35 people with a semi-automatic rifle. Um, and after that, the National Firearms Agreement was passed by the Australian government. Um, that kind of it had a whole bunch of sweeping legislation that was involved. It had a mandatory gun buyback of semi-automatic rifles and shotguns. It instituted classes of rifles and shotguns and handguns that you can own depending on your licensing. <coughs> and that, um, that did have an effect on firearm rates, as far as we can tell, a very small one. But as you can see, even with us, that didn't really institute any groundbreaking laws in that time. We've gone down more so than Australia has. Um, the caveats to that, though, are that although the U.S. has much higher gun crime than most countries, um, we have a lot higher population population density than a lot of other countries, especially Australia. We have about 10 times the population density of Australia. And another caveat is, although that gun homicide, as it was going down in the Austra after the Australian gun buyback program, um, it didn't have a really good effect on homicide, but they have not seen a mass shooting since that was implemented. And if there's one thing I can have everyone here take away, by the end of the night, is that mass shootings are a horrible way to judge violent crime in the United States and gun crime specifically. Mass shootings are a statistical anomaly. They account for less than 0.3% of all gun crimes or gun homicides from 2011 to 2015. They're really small numbers of people. Um, they're spaced out throughout the year, and it's just kind of something that we shouldn't be measuring a lot of our gun data from. And it's an average of 37.8 deaths a year between the years of 2011 and 2015.
What is the profile of a mass shooter? Um, one thing that most people can kind of agree on is that overwhelmingly they're male, and this goes back to a lot of our um, our demographics on violent crime and <coughs> gun crime as a whole, is that males are overwhelmingly more likely to commit violent crime. The average age of a mass shooter is 35 years old, which I was kind of surprised at when I went into it. I figured it'd be much younger, just judging by the media and what they played up for stories. Um, one thing for note here is 71% of them were Caucasian, were white, but that as a representative sample of the United States population, uh, people, white people are kind of 70% of the US population, so it's kind of representative of the whole. Firearms used in mass shootings. So between 1982 and 2012, this is the list of firearms that were used in the 143 different mass shootings. Uh, overwhelmingly, once again, going back to our crime data from before, semi-automatic handguns prove once again to be the most deadly uh, firearm that anyone can own or anyone can use on another person. Uh, they overwhelmingly are used more often in mass shootings, and that's true even from the data from 2013 up to 2018. Following that are rifles, and this this at least includes rifles that are bolt actions, lever actions, semi-automatic, single shots. It has the whole thing. It's not just semi-automatic rifles. Following that are revolvers, once again, following kind of the trend of handguns and then shotguns after that. My final point here, at least, is defensive gun use. And I don't hear this ever talked about a lot in the United States, and I don't hear this talked about a lot in the media. Um, a really poor metric that I've heard used is justifiable homicide. Justifiable homicide isn't a very good uh, predictor of defensive gun use, mostly because that requires someone to be shot and killed and then ruled justifiable. Defensive gun use, at least in the study that I found that was um, co-sponsored by the CDC, they found that defensive gun uses are incidences in which a gun was used by the crime victim in the sense of attacking or threatening an offender. So not necessarily killing an attacker, but either using it to kill, injure, or threaten off an attacker. Um, Estimates range from a very low end of 108,000 to a high of 3 million defensive gun uses a year. I'm pretty sure the 3 million is straight out of the NRA playbook, so probably <laughs> not that one, but something in between. Um, a lot of the stuff that I read, at least, was around 500,000. That was kind of an average from a lot of different sources. They found 500,000 different uses of defensive gun use in the United States per year. Um, and another interesting thing that the study found that people that used firearms in defense of themselves during a violent crime were much less likely to be injured in the commission of that crime or in the being fought during that crime. So people that used handguns actually were safer all around than, well, not handguns necessarily, but firearms as a whole were actually safer than people that just chose to defend themselves in other ways. And that's all I have, because I want to save a lot of time for questions. <laughs> so do I have any questions? I got a question about you know, I've just I've been looking at the uh, <coughs> FBI reports, the Uniform Crime reports, Yep. And the data is really bad when you look at that. And the reason I say that is, if you could go back to that screen, maybe you can't. Remember yeah, that yeah, screen you showed of the weapons? <laughs> yeah. And there's a there's actually a column that's in the data that says firearms unknown mm -hmm. or something like that. Yep. That's a huge number, mm -hmm. and it skews the data. Terribly, for example, if I said in a year there were 323 uh, firearm deaths caused by rifles, okay? Mm -hmm. And that was picked up from yeah. statistics from that report. Mm -hmm. However, if there are 3,000 unknown firearm deaths, mm -hmm. obviously some of those have to be from rifles. Some yeah. of those have to be from pistols. Mm -hmm. And that percentage is high in comparison. I was just looking at the last yep. two years. It's like 30% of the total. Mm -hmm. So something is wrong, or something should be improved with the way those statistics are measured. Are measured. Mm -hmm. I, if I'm correct, it comes. there's something like 18,000 police departments mm -hmm. in the country, and that's where they pick those up. Something has to be done to make that better. So a lot of, at least when I was at um, Broadport studying my criminal justice degree, a lot of times that what was used in, um, along with the UCR was the National Crime Victimization Survey, and that helped kind of moderate a lot of the um, problems that the UCR has. But even with the UCR not um, accounting for that 1,000, I think it was about 1,500 ones that they didn't know, if 
you add that directly to rifles, that's still way less than handgun uh, violence. Oh yeah, I wouldn't argue that. Yeah. But I'm just saying the, abs the numbers that they give are really not accurate. You know what I'm saying? I would argue that they are accurate with the best set of data that we have. Mm. Well, let me make another question. The, the federal, uh, the uh, Justice Department you also uses the CDC mm -hmm. uh, and the CDC records of fatal deaths come from coroners, doctors, and I just noticed that in 2016 the, uh, the FBI statistics said there were 9,000, if I remember, firearm deaths in the country, mm -hmm. whereas the uh, 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 CDC stated that there were 12,000. Mm. That's a huge difference. Again, that's a 30% difference. Yes, that's true. That's a uh, difference when you're comparing the two, but 3,000 deaths in the grand total of deaths in the United States and America every single year is not really that much. But these are firearm deaths. I, I agree firearm with you. Firearm deaths. It's, that's true. That's very true. But I'm saying that as a whole, so if there's 35,000 gun deaths a year, which is what I had for 2013 at least, if there's 3,000 extra gun deaths and that's all attributed to rifles, still the majority, of, I think the time that we should be focusing on, at least law-wise, should be suicides and then also handgun crime. And I think that's kind of what I'm trying to get at today. Okay. I, yes, thank you. Yep. Um, <clears throat> my name's Scott Snyder. I'm chime in because, uh, I mean, what I'm hearing, you've got lots of statistics, okay? Mm -hmm. And you're talking about deaths by the thousand. Okay, deaths by the thousand by a variety of guns. Mm -hmm. If you can't compare these numbers that you're speaking of with other countries on an international basis, mm -hmm. our country is completely gun death crazy. Mm -hmm. It is, without a doubt. And I find it interesting that they're able to find all these stats. But the thing is, it comes down to what is it that's causing and what is the common denominator and that is the gun, okay? Be it here or where or wherever, whatever kind of gun it was, and who got killed it, whether they were black, white, and different, mm -hmm. they were still killed by a gun. Yep. And we're talking about these stats as if it, it, it's completely incomparable to in other countries. Mm -hmm. So I how do you feel about that? I would say that as a whole, it's hard to compare. Like I said in the beginning, it's hard to compare the United States to other countries just because no, of our. No, it's not. I don't it know. is not. I'm just saying because of the yeah, amount of firearms that we have. So right now we have 100. Hey, just for a second, guys. No, just saying. For, there's 110 guns in the United States for every 100 people. Okay, so there's more in guns. One, what is it? What is the percentage? Let's let him respond. There's more guns than people in the United States. Yeah. And as a, as I'm just saying, gun crime as itself is a tiny, tiny fraction of overall deaths in the United States. That's right. So I'm saying like, I'm pretty sure 400,000 I'm 400, people die of, um, I believe, obesity and uh, cardiovascular disease every year. So compared to that, at least 35,000. It's not, I'm not saying it's insignificant, but I'm saying that gun crime as a whole isn't as big of a factor as we really should be focusing on. I have a question. Yep. When you had your data there, you don't show how many people are killed by officers in that mm -hmm. shooting. And yep. also, you don't point out the major cities are the major where the most of the gun violence is. And they have the severest gun laws in the country. Mm -hmm. And if you take those five major cities, you would have our, our statistics would be at the bottom of killings by guns mm -hmm. in the world. And you don't point those numbers out. So right now, when I, um, in the rates for gun deaths as a whole, that includes defensible firearm uses, that includes police officers, that includes everything for that. So even that is pretty small, but when we talk about population centers and how um, cities, I kind of covered that with population density. The, the more dense the population, the more likely there but is to be gun the crime. Severe, you didn't point out they had the severest gun laws, but they had the highest rate. But, so what I'm saying is that is that most cities do have very strict gun laws, but the problem with that is that all the states outside of those cities have very lax gun laws. So like New York City for the longest time, right, has very, very tough gun laws, but Vermont before their just legislation that was just passed has very, very lax gun laws. So there's actually, I believe it was called an iron funnel coming from Vermont to New York City that just, you can smuggle guns in and out of state lines pretty easily. Um, so I think a lot of the concern that we have is not passing federal back or federal gun legislation because when you have states that border each other, it's hard to control the flow of guns past the borders. I see on the news tonight before it came, uh, Georgia just joined some other states 
for banning cell phones, and they said the Centers for Disease Control I think was this where they got the stats from. There were 6,000 deaths last year from cell phones. Mm -hmm. um, that may be true, but uh, I don't I don't know if I necessarily agree with the um, status on that. Adam. Just, just the last In the stats that we were looking at, um, in the presentation that I did, obviously I saw even in New York, the definition of what constitutes a firearm changes depending on what section of the law you're looking at. And the same as federally. So when these stats are done, <laughs> is there any, any accounting for what is and is not considered a firearm? Mm -hmm. um, I think a lot with the at least federal legislation on firearms, from my knowledge of it, is the ATF has really kind of odd classifications for some things. So like if there's barrel lengths under a certain length, it's, it's in any other weapon. It's not a firearm. So I don't know what the effect of that would be on the statistics itself. But of the data that we do have, it's relatively accurate with rifles, handguns, and shotguns, which are the most prevalent firearms used in the United States. Anyone else? Jamie? Can you speak to the slide you had about demographics and why across all states, African Americans were the ones that were pointed out as the highest gun violence? So I, you'll I see this. Like that needs to be clarified. Yeah, absolutely. So you'll see, um, at least in the United States, violent crime is overwhelmingly committed by African Americans. I they make disagree. Okay. Um, they make up a minority of the um, population, but they commit more, at least with gun crimes, they commit a large majority of the gun crime. But this isn't because, I don't want anyone to think this at all, and I want to clarify this, is that I don't want people to think that African Americans are more predisposed to violent crime. That's not true. Um, a lot of the African Americans live in the population dense cities. A lot of them are poor. A lot of them are uneducated. A lot of them have had a history of violence with their fathers, with their siblings, with gang violence. And all those things are check marks for uh, not only violent crime, but gun violence. So a lot of the situations that African Americans are put in as just part of institutionalized racism and things like that of nature, it kind of contributes to that overall crime rate. Yes. Do you have any statistics as far as uh, gun violence on states that have open carry versus states that have high uh, gun laws as far as that? I actually didn't look into that. It'd be a really good thing to look into. Um, yeah, it would it'd be interesting because, especially with Vermont now, Vermont had very lax gun laws. They had constitutional carry up at this point, but now that they passed that legislation, a lot, a lot of that's changing. So that be that state itself would be a really good um, state to study in the coming years, at least, when we have more data. There's a lot of data out there. I'm sure probably you haven't uh, brought that up. Yeah. I, I don't think I even thought about it, honestly, to tell you the truth. Yes. Uh, both the, the same FBI report that we were using there and the CDC report, uh, along with quite a few other reports uh, that I've studied for the last 27 years. Um, almost every single state, uh, I think Georgia's one that's an anomaly right now, uh, the, higher, the higher level of regulation indicates a higher percentage of gun deaths. Georgia, Texas, um, Florida, uh, New Hampshire, Vermont actually had one of the lowest mm -hmm of violent crime rates by firearms in the country. There is no, no statistic out there anywhere that says a decrease in gun restrictions enhances gun violence, not one. My only caveat to that would be that, in, in the, at least in relation to Vermont, Vermont has one of the lowest populations of all the states. It's per capita, so it doesn't matter the okay. population. So those it's just like using Australia as an example. It's Australia has a total population for the entire nation, which is a continent mm -hmm. of greater Los Angeles. Yep. It's, you can't make a comparison when you have population density and population totals like that. It doesn't work. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thanks very much, Ben. Okay, next we have um, Paul Alteri, who is a um, criminal justice professor? Yes. Right. Criminal justice professor at JCC. Um, I don't know too much about Paul, so I'll let you tell him more about himself. Um, I know he's going to be sharing with us tonight um, thoughts and perspectives on the Second Amendment. Thank you, I appreciate yep. that. Thank you to Lee as well as for the invite. Cool. So thank you for the invite. I appreciate that. A nice job by my two 
colleagues here tonight. A little different perspective from my point of view. Um, first of all, I think you should know a little bit about me before I open my mouth. I am not a politician. Uh, I'm just a simple criminal justice uh, professor at Jefferson Community College. I've been there for 20 plus years. Um, and I teach in, in my, in my uh, job responsibilities. I also developed and teach a basic firearms class at JCC. Um, it took pretty much an act of Congress to get that class passed on our campus, but it worked and we started, yeah. <laughs> uh, started that in 2006 and it's uh, going strong. Um, it started out as a one credit class for five weeks, but there was so much interest in it from our students that um, I was fortunate to make it a full semester class, three credit class. And it started out with, I wanted a, a maximum of 15 students in that class, for many reasons, especially um, it's easier for me to watch 15 students than it is 35 with some of our class sizes. Um, but overnight, it turned into having three sections of that class. Now, now it's, we stopped it at that. It's at uh, 45 students every semester. A couple years ago, because I took a promotion, um, I couldn't teach the class anymore, so I turned it over to my colleague, uh, Chuck Ruggiero, who's here tonight with me. Um, Chuck's been teaching it now for a couple of years, as a matter of fact. But that, that's just one part, okay? Um, yeah, I am a certified NRA instructor in handguns. I did get my, my qualifications for defensive tactics in handguns at the Six Hour Academy. I, I, could, I could go on and tell you all about that, but the more important thing for me tonight is this is the first time I ever did something like this. Um, I wasn't originally asked. Uh, one of the gentlemen that work in my department, he was asked to be here tonight. He wanted to be part of it. Um, <laughs> so I said, I'll try it. And I appreciate it because I want to stretch my own uh, boundaries and, and speaking to a group of adults rather than 19, 20 year old adults. And I, and I think it's good for me to, to be here and do that. On the other hand, though, I don't do any of this either. I'm not a big stat guy. We'll all do this. I'm not a big stat guy or, or, or PowerPoint or anything like that. My students make fun of me for that, but this is the way I teach. I walk around the classroom, open up discussion. Many of you don't know who I am, but I will tell you this, that I do present both sides of any firearms argument as much as I can. I present the information to my students. Let them make their own minds up. I believe in critical thinking. So I let them decide which side they want to go on. And I let them not only talk about the stance they're taking, but they have to defend it as well. Obviously, I'm pro Second Amendment. I love my handguns, specifically, because that's what my specialty is, handguns. Um, I'm a revolver guy, um, but we, we teach both. Um, I am open-minded, however. But I need to, you guys to educate me tonight. Because again, this is my first time doing something like this. I, I, don't, I don't speak to crowds uh, regarding this. I go to my meetings, you know, I, whenever I can, I go to the scope meetings, that I, uh, the, the scope group that I belong to, and Bruce is here tonight. Um, but here's what I don't understand. I need, I need you uh, to answer questions that I have. I watch Fox News constantly. And everybody makes fun of me for that. <laughs> but that doesn't mean that that's where I, you know, I don't have to agree with everything they say. I'm a lifetime member of the NRA. It doesn't mean I agree with everything the NRA stands for. But I do have questions that I can't get answers to. And one of them, and I'm not going to spark any arguments here tonight, right? But I do, I would like feedback. I would like to know why it is when I do get into discussions, especially with my colleagues at JCC, which the majority of them lean left, fine. Why is it that I'm the bad guy? I, I never understood that. I'd get into a conversation with them, why do you look down on me because I feel like I have a right to carry my hand on? Why? why? I, I don't understand that. Um, oh, sure, I'll take the first one. <laughs> For the same reason President Trump's a bad guy, same reason Fox News is a bad guy. That doesn't give, with all due respect, nobody's given me a good answer yet. You know, all I get is, all I get is, you know, why do you, why do you feel like you, you need to carry a handgun? I don't feel like I need to carry a handgun. I don't live in Chicago. I don't need to carry my handgun. I carry it because I believe I have a right to. That's all. Yes, sir. Please. Um, I'm not thinking 
it's the handgun. You, you're, nobody's arguing with you, right? Sure. To carry a handgun. How do you feel about regulations to carry a handgun? That might be where they're upset with you. Yeah. I don't think so because I'm open to to uh, ideas. I'm open to. Them. I don't well, agree with some that I hear recently. Uh, honestly, I'm not a big fan of the 18 to 21 to buy a rifle in many states. I, well, I, I, that's don't, I don't understand that. You know, there's, there's students that I teach that are 20 years old, married, and children. And they can't get a shotgun? They can't buy not, a beer. What's that? They can't buy a beer. They can die in Afghanistan. That's right. All right, well, I don't want to go there. I don't want to go there. Thanks. We can talk for hours on that. All right? I'm open to all of that. And what I'll do is I'll sit and I'll listen to all that, and then I'll make my own mind up if I'm for that or not. But I, I disagree. Well, I, I won't go there either. Um, my whole point is I don't feel like this guy right here has a right to tell me how I can protect myself or my family. I, I don't think he's got a right to do that. Right. But on the other hand, he's got a right to call me every ethnic name he possibly can under the freedom of speech. Is that true? Mm -hmm. yep. Yes. I, I don't get that. I don't understand why it's okay for, for me, you know, uh, I can't say the N-word because that offends somebody. But that same person can turn to me and say, who the hell do you think you are carrying a gun? Right. What's that conversation? It's got nothing to do with it. And try to take that right away on top of this it. Is, this is where I'm just confused. And, and I know I was supposed to. Crystal. Crystal. That's right. Crystal. 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 I said crystal. It's tough for a lot of people. Crystal. 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 She asked me when I came in here tonight, what's your topic? I don't have a topic. I can give you just, just what I do. That's all. That's, yes, ma'am. I'm sorry. I, didn't I, I, just, I think one of the things that confuses me, my husband owns guns. Um, so it's not like I'm, you know, one of those people that doesn't have a clue. Uh, right. You know. Um, but I guess one of the things that confuses me is you have to register a handgun, but you don't have to register, you know, rifles. Well, I do understand why, though. I mean, a handgun, I can conceal it very well. <laughs> but why? That type of thing. Pardon but you have a weapon this evening? No, I didn't dare bring it here. <laughs> I didn't because I only I can only have ten rounds. I have the right to No, I didn't scratch that from the camera. The other question I wanted to throw at you that again I'm asking you to educate me is. Um, by the way, before I forget, the number of handguns out numbers our population nationwide, right? The number of guns. Yes. I think I did see a statistic somewhere that you can pick six states. They named them in, in these stats. There were six states in our country that together would be the, the fifth largest army in the world. That was, I, thought, I just thought that was pretty interesting. Yes, I'd like to make a comment. Certainly. And what, I don't know if it was you that said it or if it was coming from the group said, and they want to take our guns away from us. I didn't say that. Okay. But that is, that is um, one of the arguments that, that people are, like you are reacting against. And I think that you could probably take a room full of progressive people and ask them, how many of you want to take their guns away? And you wouldn't get a single hand for both no, no, it's not here. Hold on, hold on. Ask us. May I? Yeah. Right. Hey, hey, hold on. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You want to feedback? Yeah. 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 Yeah.
you know, if you agree with that, great. If you don't agree with that, great. I'm just telling you my, my side of it. I, I do believe that as soon as you get a foot in my door, you're going to want more. And the only way, one of the reasons why I feel that way is why are you coming to my house to begin with? I, that, that's what I don't understand. I saw you in the back first. Um, and then you... to, to answer the question why I get worried when people start talking about gun laws, and they actually do want to take my gun. Mm -hmm. I have a handgun permit, and under the SAFE Act, every five years you have to re-register. If I forget to do that, if, I, if that doesn't happen, what do they do? I'm a felon automatically. They take my, not just my handguns, they take all my guns. So yes, they do want to take my guns, and I, I've been a pistol permit holder since I was 21, so that's 30 odd years, thereabouts. Never had any other problems, but if I forget one time to register that, they take my guns. So I'm automatically a felon. Sir? No, they don't. Who do you think should be prohibited from guns? Again, just my opinion, you're asking for it, okay? <coughs> the problem I see with, with the stats that were shown mm -hmm. tonight, it's, it deals with mental health. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It, to me, it is that simple. I don't understand why this is such a, a an, an argued issue. Um, and I'll use that, what was it, Parkland? Is that what it was called? Yeah, in Florida? Yeah. You know, the FBI knew about this guy, the school yeah. knew about this guy, and yet all of a sudden it's the gun's fault. That's and, and that's where I just have a hard time understanding that. It's a mental issue, and, and I think, I don't know, I'm not uh, throwing anything at you that you probably don't know, but um, as a former probation officer, are there any law enforcement in here? Thank you for your service. Uh, nine out of ten people, the sheriff's here. Nine out of ten people I had on probation committed their, their crimes while under the influence of something. So while I was a probation officer, I did a lot of questioning and going to the judges and whatnot and, and attorneys and saying, look, what? The problem is that he's a burglar. That's not the problem. The problem is he does this when he's drunk. So why don't we take care of that issue? That's the real the, the, the point that needs uh, emphasizing. He's an alcoholic, and when he's drinking, he commits crimes. While we arrest him and put him behind bars, that's great. But let's let's treat him for what the real problem is, in my opinion. Uh, number three was... Ma'am. Well, I'm curious, what when you're teaching your students... Yes. <coughs> What do you teach them the purpose of the Second Amendment is? I really don't get into the Second Amendment issue. I'll, my basic firearms course deals with um, uh, proper use and safe handling of firearms, um, grip, stance, the basic fundamentals of firearms, all that type of thing. Chuck, however, teaches constitutional law, so we, we combine that. He's been to my classes before he taught him and talked about the Second Amendment. This guy's the vicar of knowledge when it comes to the Constitution, so I don't even dare open my mouth about that with him or in the same room. Um, he teaches fu basic firearms now, and I'm sure he encapsulates that. And can you answer to that, what you do with the Second Amendment, how you teach that? Please. May I say it? <laughs> <laughs> oh, <is my> <laughs> <laughs> I teach one thing about the Second Amendment, there's only one thing that needs to be taught. It is a fundamental right. It is a right. Until the Congress of the United States changes the Constitution through the lawful process to do so, it is the law of the land, and all must obey it. This is this is what I don't understand. Why does it lead to argument? I don't get that. Yes. You don't defend your rights. Oh, I understand. Children being killed, you don't understand. <laughs> <laughs> um, By wackos. So, earlier you said, just a few moments ago, you said that it's um, a mental illness problem. And I just want to... For the ask, most part, yeah. Like, um, and then you kind of segued into talking about alcoholism. And I know um, from what I have read that anybody with a mental illness is far more likely to be a victim of a crime than to ever perpetrate a crime, Except, like even with violent illnesses such as schizophrenia or anything like that. So I just want to give you a chance to clarify Thank you. that when we talk about... No, I know where you're going. I know it's where you're a, going we can talk that. about social fabric and how that's 
falling I'd apart. Rather not, I'd, I'd, but I'm I'd saying, rather not go the other way. Like I, I see what you're saying. And thank you for letting me clarify. When I mention that, that mental health issue, I'm referring to some of the most recent events, for lack of a better term, that we've had where multiple people were killed. A lot of these people who have done the killing have had a history of mental defect. That's all I'm saying. I'm not, I'm not, uh, I want to generalize that mental health. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. I don't care if you have a gun or don't have a gun. What bothers me as a citizen is that we have a federal government that has, where we have the right to bear arms, but we have all the states that do their own thing. Some have gun laws, some don't. Some you can go to the gun show and who cares, you get that gun. That's the problem. There is no uniform system. And you have organizations like the NRA that contributes to the political funds mm -hmm. to make it go their direction. And as a citizen, it, we don't even have universal background check for anything. And running these uh, background checks through Walmart is a waste of time. With all respect, you're wrong, man. The federal government, as they call it, the, the, the next check. That is across the United States by the federal government. Every time somebody buys a firearm, any firearm, they are run through a national database. Good. And, and, and but let me tell you what happened with that, though. Just so I want to inform you so you understand that. That was meant just to know that who bought it was clear that they weren't a criminal. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, that information was sold, stolen, and used against law-abiding people who then later on in life had what we call today a mental health episode mm -hmm. or a domestic episode. Didn't include a handgun or a weapon. It was used against them. That law by his citizen made them a criminal. It's, nothing's perfect. We're going to have flaws. I, I agree and, here. And but it, and you can say it's all because of mental health. No, it's not. Have, I'm not no, me. but what you right. also have is you don't have health care for people that have mental health. So we're, it, it's because of the, the crazies, they're the ones that are to blame. No. It's not. And no, it's I not. respect sure. you very much. Well, no, but no. seriously, from a person who, you know, I watch the news, and Tennessee, I don't think Tennessee has any gun laws. But then, but, but there's such a discrepancy throughout the, the states. How do you come up with a system that works? And obviously, anybody can go across a state line with a gun. I mean, seriously. Well, let me let me address the one thing. Sure, yeah. thank you for. Sure. I know I'm being very general, no, but I, right. I think this is how. I just I would just like to make a couple of points before I get the hook. <laughs> <laughs> one, I do agree with you. Um, I still don't understand New York City. If my pistol permit says New York State, I'm not allowed to carry in New York City. I don't understand that. Uh, unless I apply for one and pay $160 and, and, I get, and get denied I can that. that in Florida, but I can't bring it in this state. But that's, that's, that's one thing. The second thing is, and I'll revert back to, I think what both of you kind of hinted on a little bit. Those states that have, again, a question that I have that, that, that I haven't gotten a good answer for. New York City, that city in New York State. Chicago, in Illinois. Los Angeles, in California. The strictest gun laws, the major cities, yet the highest crime rates. I, I don't understand why we want to react by making laws that, in my opinion, concentrate solely on the law-abiding citizen, because I don't know one criminal in all my years of, of law enforcement that any of these laws will affect. I don't understand why these laws are such a great idea. For whom? Not for me, personally. I, I haven't committed a crime that I know of, that I've been arrested for. Why are you limiting what I can do with my Second Amendment right? But you're going to tell me, the politicians, are going to tell me, oh no, it's meant to, to curb the criminal. No, it's, you think they're going to listen? They're not going to listen. So that's my biggest issue that I have with this topic. Um, as far as I'm concerned, the laws that are being created, they affect me more than they do those guys behind bars. 
I can't take any more because I heard the <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all very much. Thanks. Thanks. Would someone be able to hit that light switch right there behind the door, please? Thanks. Our eyes are going to need to adjust here again. Alright. Alright, lastly tonight, um, on preventing gun, gun violence, Lee Vance um, is going to share that topic with us. Lee is a local psychologist and, and co-leader of Indivisible Lowville. Lee graduated from Lowville in 2000. And he studied clinic clinical and forensic psychology in Berkeley, California. He graduated and graduated with a doctorate in psychology from the Wright Institute and a master's in theology from the Fuller Theological Seminary. Thank you. Guys, thanks for being here tonight. Really appreciate it. Um, no, I'm good. Okay. Um, so you can't see me. <laughs> um, so I want to I want to share uh, three stories tonight. Uh, two of them will be very brief, and the third will be a, a little bit longer. First story is about uh, my wife and I living in Vallejo, California, um, just north of uh, San Francisco. Um, she was pregnant with our uh, our first um, our first daughter, and uh, I left for internship one day and went around the block, and uh, and there was a body laying on the on the sidewalk and uh, tape around it and law enforcement surrounding uh, the body. I came to find out later that, that, that it was a homicide. Um, the second story I want to share with you is one that um, isn't my own, but is an amalgam of a bunch of stories that I've heard from, from uh, good friends and very close family members. Uh, it includes one of uh, the healing experience of being up in a tree stand. That's not one I can relate to. I'm not a gun owner. I'm not. I, I, I'm not. Uh, I'm, I've never hunted before, but it's one that they'll they'll share from time to time. Um, and the other one that I hear that kind of goes along with that is this generation of usually husbands or, or sorry uh, fathers and sons uh, sharing time out in the woods together, hunting, going to the ranges together, and. Um, and uh, and in bonding over uh, something which which has become the North Country gun culture. The reason that I'm passionate about this issue is because um, not because I want to take anyone's guns, but I'm going to continue to work to find to make a way for the first story to disappear and for the second story to continue on. My premise tonight is that gun violence is a problem in the United States. I'm a, I was really happy to hear that uh, my data aligned um, with yours, Ben. Uh, 32,000 deaths and 84,000 injuries uh, equals about 318 shootings per day. By the way, I, if you want these slides, because I'm going through them quickly and everybody else did, um, I'm assuming it's okay with yeah. you guys. Yeah. Uh, here is the Indivisible Lowell email. You send me an email, say, hey, I want the slides for this presentation, this one, this one, I'll just send them to you, okay? Um, this is from the uh, Global Burden of Disease Study in 2016. Uh, I, I'm not gonna go into it uh, too much because we, these have already been presented and we've debated about whether we can share our compare ourselves to other countries. Um, according to these statistics, um, firearm deaths per 100,000 are, are the highest in the US. I did do some research and find out that Honduras 
should be actually be at the top of this list. So this <coughs> one is, is a little misleading. I um, I love that one of the safest places that out of one of the safest places in um, our country, the schools is is where a call for action has come from. Um, you are much. It is much more dangerous to be in your own residence if there's firearms. It's much more dangerous to be in a parking lot or garage. Um, it's much more dangerous, it's 10 times more dangerous to be in a restaurant than into a school. So um, I, I think that goes along with Ben's presentation uh, and Ben's data that, um, that while, while, while gun violence is an issue, um, our schools are still um, one of the safest places for people to be. Okay, a couple of cartoons that I wanted to throw, throw in here for both sides of the both sides of the issue. Lee, this, could you stand on the other side? You want me to? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. A bad guy with a gun. Here's uh, before more regulations, and then here's after more regulations. Um, this one's from the New Yorker. It says down here, okay, but let's uh, let's say you have up to 600 intruders per minute. <laughs> the first one wasn't. <laughs> we gotta we gotta be able to laugh at ourselves. Um, call for action to prevent gun violence. So my my bread and butter. I, I there is no way I'm going to be able to answer gun. Uh, statistics, uh, gun laws, the, 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 the way these first three presenters can, my bread and butter is mental health. Um, and, um, and research that is based on what, is, what creates healthy individuals and healthy communities. So February 20th, uh, the American Psychological Association that I'm a part of, as well as these, these other groups, uh, came together uh, um, in response to the, uh, the mass shooting in, in Florida. Um, and so, so, so I'm going to present an eight point, the eight points that they came up with. This was, this was a, uh, an interdisciplinary group came together, they, uh, uh, mostly of professors that studied violence. Um, I've been talking to one of them from, from Rutgers. He was the he was the uh, main guy that drafted the thing, um, and uh, and he shared with me some of these some of these points and some of the insights into them. I'm going to go through them. Um, they involve three levels. Um, the first the first level to prevent gun violence in the U.S. is a national requirement for all schools to assess school climate and maintain physical and emotional safe conditions, positive school environments that protect all students and adults from <coughs> bullying, discrimination, harassment, and assault, right? So it's, um, it's, I think that's pretty straightforward and hopefully something that we can all agree on. Um, the second one um, is a ban on assault style weapons, high capacity ammunition clips, and products that modify semiotic firearms to enable them to function like automatic firearms. Um, the second level is uh, number three, adequate staffing. Making sure that all of our schools have the professionals uh, necessary to take care of the kids who really need it. Yes, to take care of the kids with mental illness, but also the kids that, um, that are socially disconnected. Um, reform of school <laughs> discipline. Hopefully you're gonna start to see a thread in this. Um, in, in everything that I'm going to say tonight. Reform of school discipline to reduce exclusionary practices and foster positive social, behavioral, emotional, and academic success for students. Every time a child fails and is pushed back a grade, every time we send them to another school because of behavioral problems, every time that we send them to detention so that they can stare at the wall, we are excluding them. Are these practices um, are these practices working? Have they worked in the past? No, no, they do not. They do not work. They do not work. And the science and the research is 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 profound. We need to send them to someone who can help answer what is the need, what is missing, 
these are children whose brains are developing. What isn't developing the way that it, the way that the rest of their peers, the way they're, if, they're, if they're an outlier, and the rest of the peers are developing um, and able to follow instructions, for instance, and one is acting up in class, how can we meet the need for that kid to make sure that he or she is not does not feel apart and excluded? Um, Universal background checks to screen out violent offender, offenders, persons who have been hospitalized for violence towards self or others, and persons on no-fly terrorist watch list. So that's the second level. The third level, a national program to train and maintain school and community-based threat assessment teams that include mental health and law enforcement partners. I'm going to talk about that in a little bit. Uh, removal of legal barriers to sharing safety-related information among educational, mental health, and law enforcement agencies. And laws establishing gun violence protection orders that allow courts to issue time-limited restraining orders requiring that firearms be uh, recovered by law enforcement. Okay. So, um, there, I mean, there, there is so much that we could talk about that it, when it comes to why gun violence is, uh, occurs in the United States and what we can do to prevent it. I think the, the simple thing that I want to add uh, to this conversation is an understanding of how the brain develops. Um, the, the best way that I can explain it is that our brains develop from the bottom up. When we are in utero, and during infancy, we have what we call a reptilian brain. And it is, prim it is, almost, it is primarily used for instinct, dominance, and survival, right? It's like, just get, get my needs met. It's like a crying, that's all the crying baby wants. Take care of my needs. That's, that's all it functions to do. And, and make us, you know, ooh and guy at it. Um, as the child develops, we're talking five to ten years old, we're looking at the mammal part of the brain. This is, this is the social fabric. You, know, you, you probably wouldn't be interested in coming to a group like this tonight if this part of your brain wasn't developed. It's why you want to connect with people and even have the courage to connect with people that are very different than you. It's because, it's, it's because social, community, organization, coming together as a group has developed in your brain, and, but that doesn't happen until a little bit later. Um, it's finally that between maybe the ages of 7 to 15, but then the brain goes on to develop till 20, 25, and we never stop learning. But these are critical years of development that we developed the human brain. It's, it is the, port, the front, prefrontal cortex, and it's different than any other part. Uh, there's, there's nothing else in nature that has this, this part of the brain. It's where language, ideas, concepts, artistic visions develop. It's also where compassion lies. It's also where contentment, happiness, feelings of peace lie in this prefrontal cortex. Why does this matter? Um, because uh, individuals who often become violent offenders, uh, their brain development sometimes, but not always, has been damaged by abuse, by neglect, um, uh, by mistreatment. Uh, if you if you have if this part of the brain is lit up in a five year old because dad comes home drunk every night and beats the crap out of him, you can be sure that his ability to to his or her ability to develop empathy and compassion for others is going to fail. Mm -hmm. It's it's not going to happen, and we're going to call him something like antisocial, psychotic. Um, I'm not saying this is across the board. There are, the, there are different reasons for the violence. Um, but in that example, you've also got a model of what it means to be a man. Um, on an individual level, what can we do to reduce gun violence? 
violence risk assessments. So this is, this is a way to, for, so that when an individual, uh, especially in a school setting or in a community setting, uh, makes a threat, when they say that they are, uh, they, they want to commit some act of violence. Um, this, uh, a violence risk assessment involves, uh, involves trying to understand the likelihood of that individual to become violent. And it includes uh, static factors like their race, sex, and age. Um, but a mental health clinician uh, is also going to look uh, at these fluid factors, um, like depression. It shouldn't surprise most people that people that are depressed feel like there's no way forward in life. They may be predisposed to suicide. Not all the time. We all go through moments of depression. Um, and somebody who is uh, likely to commit homicide is usually isolated. Again, back to excluding. They're pushed away by society. Um, and, uh, and, and paranoia. Um, at the community level, what can we do? Um, this is already be, being done in, in many <coughs> communities. I don't, I don't know if law enforcement here is, is trained this way, but I wouldn't doubt it. That police are trained in crisis intervention skills with a primary focus on responding to special populations such as those with mental illness. Uh, community members can be trained uh, by emotional, by going to emotional CPR and the mental health first aid. These are consumer-based initiatives that use neighbor-to-neighbor -neighbor approaches, uh, so that we can learn how to help one another when we're when we're in crisis. The uh, the way that I look at human beings is that we're all well and usually well-intended people until options and resources um, run out. And at that point, we're, we need help, and we need to be able to help one another <coughs> so that we don't become labeled the bad guy. Um, school resource officers and armed personnel are trained to show a proactive presence in schools. Again, you're going to hear me talk wishy-washy like. The research shows that the, the guy that stands at the front doors of the school um, armed and scowling is not as preventative as the resource officer who notices the kids that are acting <coughs> out in trouble and goes and befriends them and models for them how to uh, how to interact in society and and tries to get some of their um, and tries to get some of their needs met if they know that they've got they're being traumatized at home they can help intervene at that level. Um, what else can we do as a community? No guns for those engaging in domestic violence. Abused women are five times more likely to be killed if their abuser owns a firearm. And we can empower the people to trigger extreme risk protection orders by petitioning the courts. So this is when members of our community really start to worry about Johnny down the road who's own firearms his whole life and has never been a threat, but he starts to deteriorate mentally, which is possible for anyone. I don't care how good of a guy or good of a woman or good of a person you think you are. Uh, psychosis, depression, um, um, coming to a point of rage or feeling like there's no way out in life can happen, especially if you're isolated. Um, what's that? Two minutes, okay. <coughs> so the extreme risk protection order allows, um, allows people in the community to come to the courts and say, hey, we'd like to petition for this guy's, this individual's guns to be taken away temporarily. Uh, and then at the policy level, again, this, this isn't my bread and butter. So you can, you, can, uh, you can call me wrong and we can and I'd like to, I want to get to the bottom of understanding policy and what works. Here's what my profession tells me. A multi-faceted approach is what works best. After motor vehicle safety efforts expanded to include the vehicle, the roadways, other and, and other intervention points, 
the motor vehicle deaths dropped uh, and they continue to decline. So we're not just targeting the user, we're not just, uh, we're not just targeting the manufacturer or the distributor. Uh, policies, uh, there's regulation across the board. Uh, research. We don't have all the research. That was something that was debated earlier, and one of the reasons is because of lobbying groups. They don't want the research to come out because it's showing that a lot of people die. So we need more research. Um, so the six strongest areas of policy. Again, I'm not a guru in this. This is what my profession is telling me, and maybe some of you guys know the policy better. But this is what I'm. This is what I'm understanding. That back, these these are the most successful at reducing gun violence. Background checks, child access prevention, concealed carry permitting, um, restrictions for, or uh, bans for those that are involved in domestic violence, extreme risk protection order. There should be an asterisk by that one. I think it's way too new. Uh, it started in California in 2016, and I don't. I don't think they're saying it's working very well. I think I think we gotta wait. Uh, and military and the ban of military style weaponry. Um, I heard this completely contradicted before, so I, I'm interested in more conversations about this. But this is data taken from the Center for Disease Control, and my uh, my pr the professor peer of mine that works at Rutgers. Put it uh, helped put it into a graph. There's no way you can tell from where you're, where you're see, see it what this is. Um, these are the list of states. Uh, the yellow lines are stringency scores. How restrictive are uh, is, is gun violence? Are, are guns in that state? Uh, how much policy is there? Um, and. Uh, That is, that is, that is <laughs> so there's here's New York right here, right? Um, deaths per 100,000 residents are the uh, the red line, and so we're finding that there is a relationship between the more restrictive the state is, the safer state the uh, state is. Yeah, guys, thank you for listening. I think if there's one thing. I think the take home message for me that w the thing that I'm certain of is that um, violence begets violence. Um, that if, uh, and that, 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 that goes for gun violence or any kind of, of violence. If, uh, if we are not corralling one another, if we are not including one another, um, if we are neglecting, abusing in any way our children or one another, um, we will create more violence <coughs> in society. Um, the more we punish by pushing kids and one another away, uh, the more uh, the more violent offenders that we will create. So thanks again. Yeah. 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 our presentation for tonight. Sorry. Uh, I know we'd love to talk and engage and ask questions, but I think where would we ever stop? You know? <laughs> so um, if possible, I think Lee and I would just like to take the temperature of the room, take a few comments on how you enjoyed the format of this evening, if it was what you came expecting. Um, and Indivisible Laval is considering continuing this model of having com a community conversation about a targeted issue and bringing people who might see that issue from different perspectives together. So think on that and let us know, you know, you can share quickly in your comments if there's an issue that immediately comes to mind for you. What about this? Like, for example, we're thinking of organizing um, forums over the summer at the opiate epidemic. So 
I'm going to really like cut you off if you start going on guns. Um, <laughs> talk, about, talk about the structure of this evening, if it was what you expected, um, how you felt like um, tonight went, and if there is a topic that you'd like to see community conversation about. Sir? I'm Steve Krager, and I went to uh, school my full uh, 13 years in Portland Central School. I was the last uh, year to graduate there. And what was impressive there for me and what I learned was that, uh, number one, we had religion in school at least once a week. Are you commenting on tonight in some way? Number two, we had the Pledge of Allegiance every morning in the school. Number three, we were taught every day the respect of life. Number four, if we got in trouble, we were sent to the principal's office and we got our ass beat by the principal. So what's your comment about tonight's My comment program? Is, that's where the problem is. The schools are not being taught. Okay, sir, you're not commenting on the program, so thanks the, for your the, thoughts. Yeah, Does somebody else have a thought? Stephanie? Yes. The high rate of sir, time in the schools. We're moving on. Okay. They're Stephanie? not teaching that. So I'd like to thank all of the people that are here. I just think it's so encouraging that our community is coming together around things that are hard to talk about. And, and even though our emotions are getting a little heightened, um, it's so good to be here. And I think we need a lot of practice doing this about all kinds of things. So thank you. That's my comment. Thanks. I would love to sit down with the two gentlemen in the front row from JCC uh, and talk because I'm from the other side and I think that you would probably think well, Liz, I'm what's your comment? Sorry, what's your comment about the program? My comment in, in terms of format is I would like to have small group discussions between people from okay. different sides. Okay. Yep. I would just like to say thank you again to both of you for coming tonight. Was, I thought this was fantastic for, for a, you know, a short time that you did this, and, and uh, it was educational for me as well. Thank Thanks. You. Thanks. Sir? Topic for Lee. How society has changed that might be spawning this type of uh, violence that's coming out of our families here. Okay. I think it has a lot to do with how kids are being brought up. <coughs> so a topic for dialogue is family yeah. violence. Yeah. Family <laughs> violence and causes. Sure, sure. So I, I would suggest that you uh, get the school auditorium because you could uh, you could <laughs> handle a lot more people. You think I can do that? I can manage that? The whole auditorium? I get out here. Probably like the cookies <laughs> <laughs> so are you yeah, saying, well, sir, a bigger space, like yes. increased opportunity yes. for us to be together? To okay, agreed. Yeah, and we actually really it. didn't anticipate having this and, and amount uh, of attendance so tonight. Yeah. Uh, when you have a group like this, you have to tell them where the exits are. You have to do all that kind Good of stuff. Yeah. You really need to do that. I mean, <laughs> it's taught to most of us. Yeah. So maybe you can do it next time. <laughs> <laughs> I see a hand here, then a hand over here. I, I think tonight shows all of us that we all have something in common that we don't have in common, or that we should or shouldn't have guns. We all have in common that so there shouldn't be guns used in violence. Sir, what's your comment about tonight about <laughs> the, the, the program? That, that's what Lee pointed out. Okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, sir. Closer to Watertown. <laughs> Into this Loudville. Loudville and all the hunters. That's me. But if you do something closer to Watertown, this is very remote. You know? yeah. I've been here a few times. I feel like I'm in downtown. <laughs> <laughs> it sends me a different way every time. Um, there's people that want to respond. That don't have the opportunity to come out here and everything. I mean, you don't have to be in Watertown, but if you had a venue closer to the city with more access, I think you find you get more people. Some diversity. Okay. And okay. like we've talked about partnering with other individual groups in neighboring communities, so you don't know. One last or two last comments on the program or other topics. I mentioned to, to you uh, before that uh, one way of doing, uh, getting more people to get their feelings out is to. Um, and you could do it at, at the school. 
is to get classrooms with a, a facilitator and uh, put maybe no more than 12, 15 people in, a, in that group. And then the group maybe have maybe three or four classrooms. Mm -hmm. And that small group conversation uh, idea. Yes, and, and everybody is given at least two minutes to say something. But you would start that off with a, a talk, or any one of these, any, any you would sell a talk, not, not 20 minutes, probably only 10. And in that way, you would get more people getting involved. And the facilitator is to keep them from batting each other's head. <laughs> that's the whole idea of that. Nobody's going to come. Yeah. That's what's going to happen. But we're all here. You, know? but, but you it, never know. It, it, allows, it allows everybody to get a chance. and. And you need to have a uh, flip sheet, sheet and somebody that just writes the notes. And you better make sure that guy knows how to write. <laughs> Great <laughs> suggestion. <laughs> Thank you. So the, the notes, then you get together. Everybody gets together and they look at all the notes. Well, you guys talked about something different. I'm, I'm going to listen to what they said. And it works. It really does work. Yep. But you've yeah. got to have facilitators and you've got to have that. Yep. American flag and pledge allegiance. And an invocation. Is there any reason why that was left out? That's your suggestion for adding it to the program? Yeah. No. Okay. That's a good suggestion. Okay. Yeah. All right. Any, I think that's good, right? Yeah. What about um, topics? So the, uh, topics. Any, other any topics. briefly other topics that indivisible, we can move away from guns and talk, for instance, the one we were talking about, the leadership was talking about, was the opioid epidemic. <laughs> that we come together like this and, and, Experts or not, we all talk about how it's impacting us. What do we do about it? Okay. Sir. What are some other topics? Learning a bit about the Constitution. Is very important. Okay. Most people don't have a clue what the Constitution. Is. Yeah. I've talked to about ten people in the last couple of weeks. They, they, oh, we can't do this. You can't do that. No, the government can't do this. The government can't. Do this. Okay. And nobody knows this. They don't teach the school. So they're ignorant. They're yeah. ignorant of that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What I don't hear in this room, we hear about lots of murders and gun violence and this and that. I don't hear about self-defense. That's a topic that really hasn't come through here. You know, I've carried a gun my whole life, and I hate to break it to you, but I taught the first gun safety course at JCC in 1977. <laughs> <laughs> and I had to go to the dean to get permission to bring it on again. Okay. My love of hunting goes all the way back. Five times now, in my lifetime, 59 years old, so self-defense. going for self-defense, including a few weeks. Okay. Uh, ben. I think one thing that everyone out of the woodwork is welfare reform. Welfare reform, um, um, safety net. Yeah. 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 Sir? Yeah. Uh, the corollary to what he said. Really need to have a focus uh, on uh, the dependency culture fostered by government. You know, uh, which you know, so many people just live on the public goal. We have a large percentage of the population that does not work, does not feel they need to work. They don't really make contribution to society, and they're not paying taxes because they don't have income, but they take a large share of the money that we earn and spend so it. Very similar to what Ben said, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> So we can do a lecture. What they're doing with the soldiers from the fact they say they're all mentally nuts and should have guns because of the PTSD. Yeah. Well, that can, yeah. That, uh, there's a couple good ideas in there about. Uh, <laughs> but they're well trained in arms. That's, that's the thing. It's very It's complicated. All right. And you have a topic? Yeah, I like the mental illness topic too because how many people are going to go forward and get help when they're taking their guns away that have hunted their whole lives? I personally know people that have had three. How many more people are going to come forward? If they're not, if they think they're going to lose their guns, people are being, you know, painted with a broad stroke. So that needs to be broken down. Well, I think, sir, do you have a topic? Um, maybe to find out why the kids today, the young kids in school today, are prone to be more violent than, we'll say, kids that were brought up in the uh, 50s and the 60s. Probably. So, remarkable thing is through the, through the course of history, 
wow. human beings have actually become less violent. That's, right. That's what I saw. It's incredible. Yeah. Yeah. We're actually, we are actually learning to talk to one another. We're learning to have compassion. So, and maybe looking at that, maybe examining that. All right, I'd like to wrap us up for the evening. Thank you all so much.